Hello, I'm Mark Hughes. Welcome to the special edition Disability Viewpoints. And it's my honor today to have Chris Sayers, and that name is familiar in the Twin Cities, because he is a reporter currently with the Star Tribune. And this was Joanne Herbs, my assistant on this show, Disability Viewpoints, idea, because uh, recently Chris had run three or four different phenom uh, phenomenal stories in the Star Tribune. And so we want to talk a little bit about that today and just catch up because it's been a while since you've done this show. Chris is so talented that he's co-anchored this show a lot of times before, and we hope in the future to get back to doing that. So welcome to the show, Chris. It's my honor to have you. And let's talk about the stories that were most recently in the Star Tribune sure. that you wrote on. Sure, and Mark, it's, it's an honor to be here, uh, always an honor. I, I love the show and thank you for having me back. It just, you're, you're it just feels great to be here. And, you're welcome. Uh, well, it's, the right time to be doing it uh, for a lot of reasons. And so I'll let you take over from here. Sure, sure. Um, you know, I've had a, a couple of stories that I think you've, you've uh, noticed. Uh, one, mm -hmm. one has to do with the uh, shortage of caregivers across the state. Uh, I do which is the Star Tribune, by the way. So. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, and it's, it, it, uh, it was, it, you know, the caregiver shortage has been an issue we've, uh, reported on for years now, um, mm -hmm. but it's it's very clear it's reached, you know, a crisis level, and we spent time. I spent time with a gentleman uh, who is a military veteran. Uh, he had served the country uh, in the U.S. Army. Uh, he had also been a volunteer fireman, and about two decades ago, he ended up getting in a in a severe car crash, and ended up. Uh, quadriplegic. And as a result of that, uh, he lost uh, mobility. And because he was unable to get a caregiver for two months who could move him uh, from his wheelchair to his bed or move him, period, he was stuck essentially in his wheelchair. And he ended up developing pressure sores that got infected. And tragically, because of those infections, uh, he had to get his legs, both legs, amputated. And so we spent time with him. It was just such a dramatic example of uh, the struggles that people are facing trying to get home care that he lost his legs. And the story at Rand Sunday had got shared all over the disability community, got huge, huge uh, readership. And these are things that probably never, ever really should have happened. Never should happen. But they do if, if things are managed right. and. You know, the state does, believe it or not, have a surplus. Right. And so some of these can be directed and the end result could be a whole lot different. I myself heard of a story where a gentleman works every day and he's having to sleep in his wheelchair because he can't get a PCA. And it isn't so bad at night because you can shower and get ready in these things, but you got to be up in the morning because your ride's coming and you got to get to work. You That's know? right. And so there, there is a PCA shortage, but that too should be remedied if, if uh, these places are managed right. And like I say, there is a state surplus, so right. it really shouldn't be happening. I mean, it's a, it's a one-on-one kind of. And uh, uh, so when we get back to session in ja early January, 2023, you know, we've got a lot of work to do. We've got a lot of introductions to make because we have a lot of new uh, people down there who just got, who are just getting elected, and so there's a lot of work to do. Absolutely, and you know, it's uh, it, it is getting to a crisis level. It is at a crisis level. We've we've seen the vacancies for home care jobs for PCA jobs balloon by sixty percent over the past two years. A quarter of uh, the state workforce agency has found that about a quarter of the um, of the uh, open PCA positions statewide are going unfilled. Right. And so folks have really struggled to get care. And the people that are hurting the most are the people that have fairly high medical needs, you know, people that need mm -hmm. quite a bit of ADLs. And um, those are the Well, folks. they need the 24-hour ovarian right. care, a lot of them. Right. And we, and we, as a state, we're here to serve the people of Minnesota. And so you try to fulfill the need as best you can. That's right, exactly. And you won't know unless somebody's telling you the story. 
Right. And then you try to try to provide. You know, I think it's the people with significant medical needs, uh, people that need 24 hour care, but also folks that are on Medicaid. You know, our um, mm -hmm. medical assistance program caps PCA payments mm -hmm. at, a, at a really low rate of about $20 an hour. And so that's what there's, is paid to the providers. And then after you take away the expenses, there's only so much they can pay the workers. Mm -hmm. And some of the workers are making as little as 12 to $13 that's an exactly hour. Right. That, and you can make more money bagging groceries at a grocery store uh, <laughs> at a fast like food store. Like some of us used to, right? Right, I, suppose, I, yeah. I did. Yeah. And you know, how fair is that, that the yeah. people that are helping our elders survive, yeah. the people that are essentially providing vital care for people are making, yeah. in many cases, less than people that are right. uh, working in. And it's a lot, lot of responsibility too. Right. Right. And but then you get those who, because they're making that amount, uh, they might show up on Tuesday, but not on Thursday. That kind of thing. Right. That one of the things that was interesting, and it's a while back because we, some have been working off campus and from home and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But before COVID, uh, even a while back, there was a SEI union, U union formed. Yes. And at that time, we were talking about, you know, $12 an hour, low rate wages and rate and this and that and the other thing. And, and somebody asked, how do you remedy it? And I said, well, here's what you do. You offer educational programs. You educate these people. Then they're paid on a tiered basis per their hours of service times their education level. Exactly. And that, of course, brings up the hourly rate but you get your education and therefore uh, if somebody else can qualify for that and they they certainly could, you're not going to have, uh, you're going to have a little less turnover rate and you're going to have people filling these positions or like a medical nurse or a yes. LPN or an RN or an orderly even yes. uh, could be doing this kind of work. So it has to be a collaborative effort. And I, I don't know if I, how far that went, but it's a suggestion that was made. Yes. And it, it might be one. I don't know. I, I mean, I think that's a great idea. I, I think the other you know, issue is they need to find a way to incentivize people to, uh, to want it, to, to do the work and to do the more complex care work. Uh, so that if you're, you know, if you're uh, taking on uh, a job or a client that mm -hmm. requires pretty high you know, care needs, there should be an incentive for that. that you know, people should be paid more for that work, maybe instead of $15 an hour, maybe they should be paid $20 or $25. But yeah. it's just clear that uh, the current system, uh, people are not being paid well enough. This is the kind of work that should be celebrated. You right. know, it should be celebrated. Right. It, this is about the survival of, you know, the human species. And it should right. be it should be rewarding and celebrated. And it, it simply isn't. The, the other problem is, you know, that as much we hate to admit it, our demographics are getting older. Yes. So there might be a bigger market for this. And you want to keep these people in their homes as long as you can. Right. Yeah, uh, because the, the institutions are getting full mm -hmm. and the demand sometimes cannot be met the way it should. And well, it's a problem. It is a problem. It's in interesting you mentioned the institutions. I mean, the gentleman that I spent time with, uh, he's, he's terrified that if he doesn't get someone uh, to care for him at home after his legs have been amputated, mm -hmm. then he may end up in a nursing home or in a group home. And the numbers show that nursing home care costs 10 times as much as home care. Well, so it, it would be in the interest of the state, you would think, uh, to want to pay f to support people in their homes yep. so that they don't end up in institutions where it's gonna cost, I mean, you don't want people to end up in institutions for all kinds of reasons. But one of the reasons is that it's just simply not cost effective. Well, the other thing is per the client, it has nothing to do with confidence, nothing to do with ego. But okay, you may have started in an institution or a nursing home right. and progressed to having your own place, whether it be a house, a condominium, uh, apartment, and you want to keep climbing those steps of success yeah. instead of going backwards. That's, I don't know of a more hurtful feeling uh, but everything has to work together. If you're going to do that, and there's some st stuff that 
you know, there's some stuff I can do, I can't do. Yes. But you have, so you have to have the whole program. If you have to have a, a PCA and you're going to go have your own apartment or live in a house or kind of minimum, you got to have reliable things. Otherwise, the whole thing yeah. is going to be at an expense for the, per the state or your insurance, and it's just not going to work. So all these things has to be to be uh, refined. So let's talk more about your stories. These are pretty interesting. Well, sure. I mean, I, I, I think... You know, there was another story directly related to this, which has been, uh, we had a story just before the election about the unprecedented, uh, at least at least in my lifetime, organizing around this election within the disability community. And one of the key issues they, you know, uh, groups are emphasizing was the caregiver shortage. The home care shortage was a, a key key piece of the platform. Uh, but we saw uh, just, just, uh, just huge organizing going on um, over two dozen organizations of the state's largest disability organizations, uh, including ARC Minnesota uh, and, and others, came together and formed a coalition called Rev Up Minnesota, which is all about getting out the vote. And um, not just about getting out the vote. They held events in which uh, candidates for public office, candidates uh, for state office, were showing up in these forums. And um, for once, candidates were listening to what the disability community had to say, instead of people in the disability community uh, listening to what the candidates had to say, they were listening to what they're, uh, they're, they're the market this time. Right, right, right. And and it was great to hear that, to see that. I sat in on several of these forums and watched them, and people really hit home the idea that look, you know, we're about twenty percent of the population. You know, if, if you don't have a disability, you probably almost certainly do know someone who does, yep. uh, over 400,000. We all do, just some are hidden, some are out there. But. Exactly. That's right. And, you know, it's a huge voting block. Uh, it's one of the biggest voting blocks out there. And so to hear them hitting home those messages and to come together, you know, uh, was really, really inspiring. And, yeah. um, you know, it, it, it really comes on the heels of the 2020 election where the disability turnout uh, just soared. In 2020, it was up 30 percentage points, yeah. not 30 percent, but 30 percentage points, the mm. turnout within the disability community in 2020. And the major reason for that was there was a real emphasis on uh, on mail-in voting, remote voting. And, you know, we'll see if, if that uh, same level of turnout occurred uh, for the midterms. But we're starting to see this momentum where uh, the disability community, which has often been very Fragmented, has right. really come together around. Well, there there were there were very varying reasons for that. They right. couldn't get a ride. They needed somebody to go with them. Those yes. type of things, you know, yes. just to name two of them. And I know that Colorado statewide, if you lived in Colorado, you got a mail-in ballot. They were trying to do that for the whole people of uh, of Colorado. And Steve Simon has done a good job of saying that we've had. The number one voter turnout. Yes. Uh, the thing that I think was interesting was Kim Crockett making a yeah. absurd statement yeah. on yeah. Disab disabled people shouldn't uh, be allowed to vote or something like that. Yes. And uh, I, in all my years, and I'm not 16 anymore, I have never heard anything like that. Yeah, it was pretty shocking yeah. uh, to hear that. And she yeah. went on a radio show. Uh, and, and indicated that, uh, and basically openly questioned whether uh, people with disabilities, if they couldn't, if they couldn't vote on their own without <laughs> assistance, she questioned whether they should even be allowed to vote. And pretty yeah. appalling uh, statement to be to be made by someone who wants to be Secretary of State. And Steve Simon, basically, I interviewed him about this, and he just said, in his view, that disqualified her. Yeah. Uh, from the office. It disqualified her. It was a, an appalling statement in his view. And I think it appall, appalled a lot of people uh, with disabilities and pe even people without disabilities. I mean, that, that, yeah. that might have friends or relatives uh, yeah. that might need help voting. We're appalled that someone would actually question. Well, well let, me, let me tell you your how. right to vote. Let me tell you how I really think that works. You can have a person, be they male or female, at any age. Who cannot speak like you and I can, yes, and may talk on a bliss board, which is they can 
key in their words and it comes out or talks to you on a, on a machine. But their intelligent level is very high. Yes. So don't discount because that person can't talk or can't be at the polls by themselves, needs help. Right. That they can't vote because they can. And they usually want to because we want to be part of the, the crowd, part of the, mar part of the population. And I think it is a little below the belt and unfair that that really happened. But let me explain it again. Because a person can't talk doesn't mean that they're not intelligent. Yes. And can't be out on the, out on the road handling what they need to handle. I mean, and that was, that was really bad. And I, yes. that almost should have been edited per air. I don't know if you can do that because it's voting, but that should almost been re-edited or re retaken. Well, you know, uh, Kim Crockett claimed that the, her comments were taken out of context, but you can go back and listen to the radio interview, yeah. and there's no question. She openly questioned whether, whether people with disabilities should be allowed to vote, which is just a shocking statement when you're talking about 20% of the population. But it also shows that they're just, we still have a lot of education to do uh, around the issues and uh, around access to voting. Uh, That's why your articles are so important. Well, you're the one educating me. I mean, I, I appreciate that, but. Um, <laughs> you're very kind. If I'm educating you, we won't be here very long. We'll be at lunch, but that's <laughs> not you to say. But um, the other thing that is interesting and just developing in the news is you know that former Governor Ventura and Governor Walls are gonna get, get, get together and talk about CBD. That, the reason I mentioned mm -hmm. that on this show is not to promote or deny it, but people with cancer usually are recommended if they need it for their treatment to try it. Yes. And so it has already been out, put out for those medicinal purposes, but now it's gonna be more of a, uh, looks like it's gonna be more of a social thing. Good. And, and, a, and a money maker. So that's just coming out. It'll be interesting to see how that works. Yeah, that is, that will be interesting to see. Um, have, have you used CBD on no. a personal level? Okay. No, no. Yeah. I, yeah. I, if I had to, I think I'm going to go right on the record and say that I probably would if it was my only resort. Yeah. But there are other ways to treat that. And uh, sure. so at this point, there's no need to. But if there ever was a need to, I, I would think about it. You know, if you want to better yourself and get feeling better at the end result, yes. and that's the, the way down the trail, that's what you do then. Yes, yes. So, I mean, I, I've spoken to many people, friends, family members, veterans that, you know, speak to how CBD and cannabis can help with their anxiety levels yeah. uh, and uh, if they have trouble sleeping. I mean, there's all yeah. kinds of reasons there, there's why. No, there's no question that it's used for more than one right thing you know absolutely and uh even around the studio not very far you can get some yes it's available for purchase and so you know it's gonna become more and more of a news story and in, in the star tribune probably and and on television so stay tuned is all we can say. stay tuned you yeah. know it's one of the first questions that one of my one of my kids asked after the election is, well, what does this mean for legalization in right. Minnesota for uh, marijuana? And I think it's something and we want to watch. And you told me to get back to him on it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's something to watch. And, but it's just been so, uh, it's been so heartening yeah. uh, to see in this election cycle, to see the disability community come together. Um, I use that term disability community sometimes too often because it has yeah. been disaggregated. Well, and, we, but, but that's what, uh, that's what it is. It, it is. It is what it is. Uh, sometimes I think we work very well together and sometimes we need to work harder together. Right. And, uh, right. and it just depends on what we have. I think now with the big change in our political structure, uh, we're still going to have to work hard. Yes. But I think you'll get a much better result uh, in the near future. So I think so. For the disabled community. I think so. You know, in so. all those candidates that went to all those forums that were that were put together by RevUp and by Arc Minnesota, I mean, I hope that there's going to be follow up to 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 see you know what what exactly are you going to do about these issues? I, You've raised the issues around metro mobility and yeah. well uh, the insane schedules yeah. and yeah. I've talked about the caregiver shortage. 
uh, let's just hope that uh, those issues are taken up in the legislature next year. Yeah, and I, I think I think there will be, but I also think we need there to be there to lobby. And I know that when it, the session starts on Jan, about the 3rd of January, 2023, leadership has already said you really can't Zoom. You need to, you need to be there. Yes. So you better go buy a fleet of cars and have them run, run and run one with four wheel drive so you'll be sure you'll be there. Uh, and, uh, and some reliable transportation because they may make an exception, but remember, they may not. So that's right. You you gotta you gotta be around just the way it used to be. So uh, anything else that we should talk about on your stories? I mean, those those are the big issues. I mean, just the unprecedented, I would say, uh, at least in my lifetime, the political organizing that occurred, um, the, the the fact that we're in this home care crisis that we've got to resolve, and it's uh, I think it's gotten to that point where it's really got to be all all hands on deck. Do you do you think that any but he could have seen it coming and forecasted a little better. Yes, yes. I mean, I, I think that there's a cycle when the, when the economy improves and the job market improves. Historically, uh, other jobs become more attractive for people, and it mm -hmm. becomes difficult to fill uh, home care positions. And that's been the cycle for decades. So they, yes, this could have been forecast. This yeah. could have been anticipated, and more could have been done. Uh, to address it before it got to this crisis point where people people are literally having their limbs amputated. I mean, right. one of the, this gentleman that I featured on Sunday, his sister said, you know, my brother sacrificed his limbs mm -hmm. for the caregiver crisis. And I, I just think that speaks volumes. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we both know other people that have struggled, uh, mm -hmm. and not, not, not uh, just this gentleman. Uh, with filling care jobs, so it's it, it has to be addressed. Well, it, it's interesting in that in that in two thousand eight when we had the mortgages underwater, and then in two and we had coronavirus uh, that put everybody at home for a while. That it, people were trying to find jobs, making career uh, changes, and healthcare was uh, uh, one of those that was advancing. They're always you always have to be in there. Healthcare field, yes. hospitality didn't do so well because the restaurants and bars and hotels and such shut down. But there's always healthcare, so there may be an open market coming up uh, real soon. Yes. So, anything else we should cover? Uh, those are the big issues. Like I said, always an honor to be here and, and talk about these issues. Thank you. And then if we do a final word segment. Any, anything you want to tell anybody? I would just say. You um, want to say hi to the family and home or. <laughs> I would no. I would just say to uh, you know uh, keep an eye on um, this organizing effort that's happening uh, within the disability community and uh, see if they deliver during the legislative session and hold our public figures accountable. Um, I think that's going to be a big thing to watch. We're going to be covering it in the Star Tribune. Um, so as always, I, I guess I'm biased, but read the Star Tribune. Do you, do you think how? Uh open do you think the governor's administration is to some of these issues? You think we have a chance there? I know yes. in transportation he doesn't want to, he hasn't said too much, but. I mean, I, I think that power above responds to power below. And so uh, there obviously has to be what you just talked about, people showing up at the Capitol yeah. uh, and not just on Zoom. People we do. showing up in large numbers yeah. and uh, making making their presence felt kind of like they did in 1990 before the ADA was passed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, ideally, but there needs to be that physical presence. I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm that young, I remember that. I, I don't think this administration has been viewed as very uh, friendly yeah. towards people with disabilities. Uh, not hostile, but no. but not exactly friendly. So there needs to be more education there. Um, and they, these groups need to be as active as well, any other group, whether it's labor unions or any other organization. Well, any, the other thing is that our populist groups are uh, getting to be more and more, you know, uh, Indian, yes. LGBTQ, uh, disabled, uh, so on and so forth. And so I, I think they know that. And I'm going to make, I got about three minutes left, so I'm going to tell you that uh, I saw the governor recently mm -hmm. and he uh, said, well, what are you working on? I said, well, I'm working on transportation, metro mobility. Yes with Rupp Muller, and she knows there's a surplus 
And there'd be a lot of cutbacks on Metro Building now starting uh, later this month. Yeah. And at any rate, I just want to give you a footnote that I was right not far from you. Mm -hmm. And I was supposed to have, I started out with a 10 o'clock ride, got listed for 1015. Mm -hmm. They got there 1044 and there were four pickups and drop offs ahead of me. So I was 45 minutes late for my own show. And I apologize to the people here at SPNN. I think it's rude. Yes. There's nothing I could do about it, but somebody's not managing. Yeah. And it bothers me when it's taxpayers' money and business people's money involved. And that's another something we need to do, you know. Yes. For a success, you need to have successful employment, successful transportation, successful PCA. But the point is it all yes. goes hand in hand. Yes. And, uh, and you know, the train's derailed a little bit. And so we need somebody to, to pay good attention. Yeah. And uh, so what we can say is keep watching the news, keep reading the Star Tribune. A lot of us depend on it and have a lot of fun over there. But uh, but please uh, keep reading the Star Tribune. You've done a great job. And all I can say is uh, is uh, thank you very much. I know you'll be down at the House, Senate, and Capitol when we get going yes. on uh, 3rd of January. So I'll yes. see you down there. Uh, any final thought you want before we go? No, just uh, thank you again. And, you know, what you just said is, I think, speaks volumes, you know, that, uh, you know, you're, you, you are late to your own show because of these transportation barriers, I think, is, is a message everybody should hear. That don't need to be. And they won't, right. they won't bring it back to the empty seat to bring, bring transportation under one roof, which would be the conversion would be mighty expensive. But at the end of the day, the streamlining would make it yes. pay for itself. So there you go. Well, anyway, we're going to uh, wrap this thing up and thank Chris Sears for, from the Star Tribune for making a special effort to be here today. Thank you. Uh, we, we hope we've helped you, and uh, thank you for being here, and we'll see you real soon. Thank you. And I'm Mark Hughes for the rest of the team here at SPNN. It is our 25th year, so thanks for watching, and uh, we'll see you real soon on the next show. And if, uh, by all means, if you have any disability concerns or any other concern, Please uh, get a hold of Chris Sears, uh, email, write, Twitter, whatever you need to do to get a hold of him. Uh, he's always around. So thanks for watching. I'm Mark Hughes. Bye for now.